Uh, Lucy, so great to see you. Welcome to Toronto. Welcome to Hot Talks. How exciting you. is this for you? Yeah, I'm I'm biggest surprise of my life. Why? Come on. You you got talent out the yin yang. What are you talking about? Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> How did you get to see my yin yang? <laughs> We go way back. It's all good. It's all good. Listen, I was absolutely riveted by this documentary. So my first question is, before we get into it, why has it taken you so long to direct? You did a spectacular job on this. Oh, thank you. Well, it looked like such a terrible job to me. You know, in episodic television, which is where I spend most of my time, it's just a lot of clock watching and, um, and compromise. Moreover, you can't put your imprimatur on it because it's somebody else's baby do you know what I mean right. you're slaving to an already set rhythm but I discovered that film is, is really the director's medium and that's where it's it, with, with a little help from your friends you know there's a whole team but it's all on you and um and I have learned a few some good lessons through making my first film and uh I can't wait to test my metal against the next idea yeah, well, I can't wait for that either. But this one, my God, um, Margaret Moth, what a powerhouse. What a badass. What yeah. she did with her life from beginning to end. You cannot write this stuff in a script. Like, yeah. it's astounding. When did she first get on your radar, Lucy? And, and when did you know that you were like, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna tackle this? No, I got a, um, a cold call, an email actually, from uh, a chap called joe duran who was her best friend said do you want to make a film about my my buddy margaret moth and my mind cast right back to 1992 when my whole country was riveted to cnn because one of our own mm -hmm. um, uh, kiwi woman yeah. had been injured in sarajevo um whilst working as a camera person and um i didn't know anything about her except for that that uh, news report which right must have been identically burned in my brain because I immediately knew all I needed to know. And I jumped on it and made all kinds of astounding promises that I would find the money, I'll find the producers, we'll find a director, this has to be made. And I was really only thinking of, of producing at the time, but um, a couple of weeks later, they all, they all, um, you know, I picked them and they picked me back. And then somebody said, why don't you direct it? And I'm like, no, don't be silly. And then I thought, of course it, I should. There's absolutely nobody who cares about this project in the way that I do. Yeah. And now I know that is a very special feeling that when I feel like I want to get down in the dirt and wrestle with an idea for years on end, I, I've got the sticking power, the, the stickability to obsess on this, the, the exclusion of most of the other things in my life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then you're lucky because, okay, you, you had Joe as kind of your center there, you know, but what I what I love is that we, we really hear from so many people that were involved in her life from beginning to end. I mean, it's astounding. And thank God, you know, they're still alive and they were able to talk most of them, you know what I mean? But um, how hard was it for you to kind of start gathering all of this stuff? Because it's kind of hard, I guess, to, to get a lot of her personal, you know, personal items or things, you know, like you had her first lover, you know, Jeff, and then on and on. Like, it just astounds me. But how, how difficult was that for you to start gathering all this stuff and then going through it? Well, Margaret had been quite good at keeping uh, track of, you know, those were her hospital letters. So I had uh, screeds of, of her hospital writings yeah. that could not make it into the film because, you know, films about keeping the audience in one little shopping trolley and pushing them up over hill and over dale, you know, for sure, for and sure. not letting yeah. them get off. So lots of stuff fell by the wayside. But um, I had her photographs, I had her six, her film, and then um, I just got on the on the phone in New Zealand, and one person led to another, and eventually I found some little gems like. Some guy who was at art school with her said, you know, I think I have some 16 mil undeveloped in my garage that I shot of Margaret at art school when she was 21. And he said, would you like it? I said, yes, please. <laughs> you know, so we digitized it. And that actually is the uh, 
you know, the first image you see and almost the last image you see is, is his yeah. push of Mark staring straight down the barrel of the camera. So some of it was serendipitous. Um, what was the other part of that question you asked? The lovers. Just, what, what was the hardest, the scariest thing and the most important thing that, one of the most important things that I do is the stewardship of the interviewees mm. because, it takes a while to build a relationship of trust and exactly um, yeah yeah and i want them to know they actually can trust me and uh because i'm not there to screw them over yeah but i'm here to tell margaret's story my way and um so yeah there's a lot of a lot of love and a lot of calls and a lot of um relationship building yeah and you know i i'm watching this and i always say to myself, oh, thank God I went into entertainment journalism. I could never do what these people do. I could never go, go to a war zone or as a journalist or as a, as a photojournalist or whatever, producer. Sorry, I, I'm happy in my little entertainment bubble here, I got to say. But I do appreciate, and really more than from watching this documentary, what these people do to tell us the real story. And Margaret, you know, she went, she went above and beyond what we see what she did. Like, Okay, so after doing this whole film, Lucy, did you ever figure out how a person does what she does? Like, wh where does this personality come from? Where does this drive come from? Where does this fearlessness come from? Um, I did ask all the journalists, is there a commonality? And they said, no, that hmm. all walks of life, people with happy child, blissfully happy childhoods and miserable childhoods are, are drawn. And there's many different personality types required to um, to fill all the roles that you need in combat. There's engineers and all kinds of things. Um, but I think the, the least understood the most of what, what people are trying to identify is that there is such a thing as being trauma bonded to the job, yeah trauma bonded to the people who are in war wherever the conflict is they want to get there because they understand that relationship between their job and the non-combatants of war who are so disproportionately affected by uh to, you know the bombing of all kinds of um assholes yeah yeah so um they are trauma bonded to the to the um non-combatants of war and and the importance of their role in their lives. So part of my mission on this, a secondary part was to shed light on not only Margaret, but all her colleagues who even as you and I sit here are facing um, uh, un uh, incalculable dangers to bring the truth, um, the yeah. truth of their images. What's done at the other end when they package these things, yeah. what the the messaging is a, propaganda is a whole other story, but those people have no self-interest apart from um, the fact that they are bonded right. um, to, to the gig. Yeah, and then, of course, you have her colleague who was sitting in the front seat of that van when yeah. she was shot through the jaw, um, and so you have his first-hand account. So it's not like you're, you're just hearing it third party. Like, you've got him. Yeah. What was it like to sit there and interview him and hear these stories of what really went down? He and Susan Stein, who was in the car behind, in the follow yeah. car, actually. Um, well, I knew that the, he would be a great interview because of his warmth, because of his honesty. Um, uh, oh, it was great. And I knew that he also, he can put you in the moment of what it feels like when a bullet tears through the atmosphere of a car which is very stable and suddenly it's rent in not just in twain and in a billion um directions uh and what that feels like to a human being so i knew that he was really good on the ballistics of things yeah and what it sounded like he acts it out you know like a drummer and um i just knew he was a great and he's very he's very um credible because he doesn't varnish things you know yeah, yeah, He's a oh. reliable witness in a way. Just rivet, just riveting. And I also love the fact too that even for the fact that you had a lot of footage to work with, no question. I mean, she shot, you know, so much stuff. Um, but when you did the dioramas of like 
how the van, you know, goes through this wasteland. Well, how did you envision that? I that's brilliant. It just really brought me into it. Honestly, I, this is such a good, good film. You did such a good oh, job. Thank you. Um, well, hang on, there's two parts to that because actually uh, Margaret's footage was very hard to find because camera people didn't get credits in those days. Oh, and they point. filmed everything on like beta, big beta tapes yeah. and they edited in the field and satellited the finished package back to Atlanta and you know, CNN in Atlanta. And the rest was either taped over or destroyed because they just couldn't store all this data. So I had a real problem with that. All the great B-roll where Margaret would be talking or something, most of that was missing. Um, so there is a good bit of other people's work. I tried to make it comport with her um, press passes and her visas. Mm. Um, and events that I knew she was at. There's some footage there that's definitely hers because she kept the tapes herself. Um, she was quite naughty in that way, but she, she, <laughs> I think she knew that there was no way to store it. So there were a few things that she kept. Um, uh, anyway, so that's about, you know, it's not all Margaret's footage, but I'm here to make a film. I'm not a journalist. I'm yes, taking yes. an emotional journey. What was the other part of it that you Dioramas, mentioned? Dioramas, like just, you having that right. vision right because there's no camera rolling when she's in the in the back of the van driving right. to work with her colleagues so how do you create images for that and somebody it wasn't me said what about diorama mm. and i was a child of the 70s so by golly i understand diorama because that Same. was Paris FBI, wasn't it yeah right. and that's how we created worlds and it was and it's so magical i, I knew instantly it was like uh, it's so old it's fresh again yeah and um and because of the budgetary constraints it meant that our options for colors of the world in the background was so limited we have no background so there's a black curtain but what's that puts you into this uncanny world which i love and then because we could have so few colors i made sure there were colors that color combinations that do not exist in nature so that you would be <laughs> uncomfortable watching it yeah there's a black sky and this kind of midnight sun um an apricot light and the green cast of the skin and the gray buildings or the or the desiccated biscuity colors of um of the lebanon scene so it would put you in a state of anxiety yeah and then compound that with good sound uh, editing and music so that the audience feels they're in this almost a submarine environment that's restricted and it's uncomfortable or yeah. it's searing and that that something bad is going to go down yeah so um yeah uh, it's brilliant yeah. it it really really worked it really it, honestly it's so so well put together was it difficult sitting there with her family and talking to her family members a little bit only because they're so cut off from their feelings they too grew up in a pitiless environment so yeah. they don't have any they don't have a lot of insight into what they were lacking right so now they're in their 60s and um they can't look back on their childhoods and go you know we really deserve better i said that to one of them and she looked at me like huh it's like she'd never considered it that they deserved wow. a better start in life so they're all completely you know, bloodless about the way things went down, which makes them brilliant because they were they were a little bit um, oppressed by the presence of the camera, right? But um, so they did soften some of the terms that they used, but it wasn't because they were trying to protect themselves or Margaret. They were they all knew everything about Margaret: the sex and the drugs and the punk music and the whatever she was very open about that so that was wonderful because yeah. um nobody's hiding anything you know yeah yeah um, you know just just to wrap it up because we only have another like a minute or so i could talk to you for hours about this it's so good but you know we we find out early so sorry i'm not giving anything away she just didn't want to have children she had her tubes tied whatever she didn't want to have kids. She, her her job was her life this is what she wanted but what made me kind of smile in this film is when she was shooting the children in these war-torn areas 
and the smiles on their faces and how comfortable she was around them. I know. that right? They were her children. That's where she discovered her grace, you know, was her love for humanity because she had none yeah. in, on Civvy Street. She just thought everybody was an absolute waste of time. Exactly. Except for, I mean, she did like the, you know, the kids with a broken wing. And she, would, she was very helpful to a lot of young women. She actually mentored people really well. Yeah. Um, but she could also be cruel, especially to guys, even if yeah. they didn't deserve it. Um, so, uh, so where was I going with that? What was, what was the question again? About so, the children and how, how, it, how... yeah, yeah. Uh, they, she discovered her children. Yeah. 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 That was her redemption is that through when after the sniping, all the baubles of her life fell away. She discovered this sort of pure expression and and lived to serve mm. like the children of war instead of just living to consume and covering covering up this void, this dearth of love that um, and pity that she'd started out with. I think she learned to pity the world. Yeah. Yeah. What an inspiration, man. What, what a story you did. So, like I say, fabulous job. I hope that we will see you again, though, in front of the camera at some point. Um, yes, I'm making a show called My Life is Murder, which has just done its fourth season. And um, uh, we'll continue to make that as long as they'll let us. Um, but definitely directing has hooked me. So I'm, I'm trauma bonded to the job, Bonnie. <laughs> uh, good. I'm glad. I, I was going to say, I think you found your colleague, Lucy. I really, really do. Well, you're a warrior queen, as far as I'm concerned, as a director. So there you go. Well, Margaret was making, Margaret made me. That's yeah, why. Well, what an inspiration. What a great topic. And thank you for bringing her story to the screen. It's fantastic. Have a wonderful we, you know, time here in, in Toronto. And uh, always a pleasure and an honor to talk to you, Lucy. You did such a great job. Thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Thanks okay. so much. Thanks for yours. All right, take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye now.